Daniel Priestley, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. Thanks for having me on the digital version. <laughs> Absolute pleasure. It's a shame you're not in Manchester live to see us, but I'm sure this will be great. Um, <clears throat> would you be kind enough to introduce yourself, please, Daniel? And tell great. Yeah, are. so I'm the CEO and the founder of an organisation called Dent Global. Uh, we run business accelerators all over the world. We've got an office in London, Sydney and Toronto. Um, we work with about 3,000 entrepreneurs to help them to stand out, scale up and make a positive impact in the world. Um, over the last 10 years, I've written four best-selling books on entrepreneurship uh, and we've worked with some of the most celebrated entrepreneurs in the world who uh, mentor our clients. That's brilliant. Um, the theme of Creative North this year is collaboration. Um, what does collaboration mean to you? What's your headline on, the, on collaboration? Um, well, for, for me, it's about unlocking um, resources and it's overcoming the illusion of limited resources. So there's this idea that a lot of people have that it's a terrible time to be in business. There's not enough resources. There's not enough to go around. There's not enough money, not enough stuff. Um, and for me, collaboration means actually complete flip on that. And as soon as you get a collaborative mindset really in action, you realize there's never been a better time. Uh, to be out there and building a business. There's more money on the planet than ever before, more PhDs and master's degrees than ever before on the planet. Uh, there's more networks, distribution channels, technology that's freely available. Um, so it's actually the most incredible time ever to be an entrepreneur. And uh, there's never been more stuff if you know how to go out and, and, uh, and access it. And, and one of the cornerstones for that is collaboration. So in my mind, everything that you could possibly want or need, whether it be money, fame, uh, or any other resource, someone already woke up with it to this morning, they got out of bed, and they had all the money and all the fame and all the great product and all of that sort of stuff going on. And collaboration means that you go out, you find them, and you discuss with them how you might be working together and how you could add value to each other to unlock even a better result. Um, so that is, to me, that's the power of collaboration. That's great. That's that's really interesting. Um, so continuing on for that, then, I mean, um, imagine you're stood in front of a, you know, a room full of people at the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester, hanging on every word. Um, what might you have? Uh, what might you have shared with them? What sort of things would you have, would you have covered in your presentation? So there's an approach to collaboration that I've used since I was a teenager, actually. Um, and back in the day, I used to run um, nightclub parties, and I used this particular model for that. Um, I launched my own business when I was 22 years old with nothing, no resources at all. Um, you know, I was reflecting just the other day that uh, you know, 20 years ago, I was working three jobs, sleeping on a garage floor and pizza delivery driving, door knocking and bartending just to survive on the basics. And, um, you know, so I really did start with zero resources uh, in a modern world sense. Um, and... Uh, and through the power of collaboration, launched a business that went to 11 million in revenue um, before to age 25, uh, and also then came to the UK, launched a business that grew within its first two years to 4 million pounds of revenue using collaboration. So the, 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 the method or the model that I talk about is um, what I call the partnership triangle. And there's three sides to the triangle. One is the brand, one is the distribution channel, uh, and one is the quality of the product. And essentially what you're trying to do with collaboration is bring together and expand the three sides. So you're trying to get bigger brands, greater distribution, better products. Um, and you're partnering with people who can expand the triangle in all three directions. So um, for example, when Nike says we wanna launch a, a new tennis uh, you know, line of products, they say, great, let's, who could enhance our brand? It would be Roger Federer. Um, who could help us develop the product? It's, you know, fruit of the loom for, for, for the actual um, physical products, the T-shirts. The um, who has big distribution? Walmart. It's like, okay, by partnering with Walmart, Roger Federer and fruit of the loom, we can actually build a, you know, extra $50 million business uh, selling T-shirts um, for, for tennis. Um, Nespresso was a, um, a dead brand that it was owned by Nestle. 2006, a new CEO came over, or 2005, a new CEO came in and said, we want to reinvent um, uh, Nespresso. They said, let's get George Clooney to be the face of the brand. 
let's get Megamix to develop a, a better product, um, an actual physical device that people love having in their kitchen, and let's do an exclusive launch with Selfridges as the distribution. So it's these, this, this um, recurring theme of brand distribution product. And rather than trying to create a, a, a partnership that is um, two parties trying to be all things to each other, uh, you know, and kind of satisfy everything, it's like, no, no, let's compartmentalize just little parts of that partnership and, and let's have three parties at least uh, representing those angles. Um, and and that's, you know, that's a, a powerful way to structure partnerships. Well, that's how I've been structuring partnerships um, with my businesses. Yeah, it's really interesting. How how do you see this um, approach uh, applying itself in the, in the creative world, for example? I mean, this is a conference of copywriters, marketers, creatives, um, agencies, freelancers. What, what sort of um, lessons might you might you share with, with people? Yeah. There? So let's let's imagine a digital agency, six or seven people working um, in a very competitive space. There's hundreds of little agencies like that. Um, you could enhance the brand by having a um, a well-known speaker in your niche, in your uh, in your industry, who who does a conference with you. You could enhance the brand by having a non-executive director uh, or a chairperson. Um, <clears throat> when I was 22 years old, I, I launched a business that was you know a little creative event marketing, event management business. And one of the first things we did is actually signed a big name person to give a weekly talk on on the topic. Um, and we paid $1,500 per talk and we did 40 of those throughout the, the course of the first year. And every week we had 70 people come in and listen to a talk with this particular well-known person. And that drove our revenues up over $1.3 million in the first 12 months. And it was really down to the fact that we had a big name person associated with our brand. Um, you know, behind the scenes, we did all the normal work you'd imagine, but having a big name person giving a weekly talk totally transformed um, our ability to generate interest and, and generate uh, clients. So that's an example of a brand uh, partnership. Um, now, mind you, uh, you might say, oh, well, $1,500 per talk, that sounds pretty expensive. Well, you know, part of the deal was that we had terms. So we had 60 days to pay, you know, so we generated a bunch of business. We, we signed up the clients and then we paid the speaking fees. Um, so, you know, that was part of uh, pitching that deal and making sure that that deal um, would, would work for all parties involved. Um, let's say that that agency wants to have a product partnership. So imagining that they're a, uh, a digital agency that builds websites. It's like, well, we can have a partnership with a film production business that does the film. We could have a partnership with the um, Facebook ads and the Google ads uh, company that, that sets up the advertising schedule. Um, we could have a, uh, a partnership with a podcasting business that does audio podcasts for the client. Um, and puts them into the into the site. We could have a social media agency that sets up all of the social media things. So now we're offering a much more complete solution. Um, you know, because when people buy a website, they don't really want a website. What they really want is interest and people coming to them and they want to show up powerfully online. So if you kind of have all the things that allow people to show up powerfully online, you've got a better product. Um, so that would be a product partnership. Uh, distribution would be to find existing conferences and perhaps sponsor them, um, to find existing podcasts that already have thousands of listeners and somehow collaborate with them or sponsor with them. So you're basically solving three problems. How do I have a, bit, a better cut through brand? Who would I partner with to achieve that? How would I have a more complete, uh, more valuable product and who would I partner with to achieve that end? And then how would I uh, distribute and get myself in front of more people um, uh, and have greater reach and who would be the right partner for that, uh, for that goal. So you're kind of stretching that triangle in all three directions with a different partner on each side. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I guess in a weird way, we kind of, each of us individually or as a, as a company, sort of does a version of that anyway, um, just naturally. What sort of skill sets do you think we ought to sort of work on or develop or confidences to, to uh, make us more partnerable or to identify better partnerships, do you think? Uh, there's one, one skill set that I think is really important, or it's a mindset more than a skill set, but it's the mindset of really digging deep to find out what the other party wants and needs and seeing if you can truly, truly, truly solve that problem for them. 
Um, so it's showing up with a big genuine part. You know, you park your own needs to the side for a minute and you've got an idea as to what you want a partnership to do for you, but you completely put that in the parking lot and start asking a lot of questions about what are you trying to get out of this? What, you know, what does success look like for you? What are your, what needs are you trying to get met? And then just keeping that open mind about how that might happen. One of the, one of the big things that's happening with a lot of entrepreneurs is that they have a technical expertise, a technical skill that they're good at. And they almost can't let go of that to be the entrepreneur versus the technician. So it's kind of like the skill set is, is the mindset of the entrepreneur that you need to be able to switch gears between the person who's a creative genius who can do amazing web copy and websites or um, you know film production scripts and all that sort of stuff. You need to be able to park that and say, all right, I'm putting that persona to one side and I'm going to adopt a new persona called the entrepreneur. And the entrepreneur is looking at things saying, okay, who else could I get involved? Who do I know in my network? Um, how could I solve that problem creatively you know, without using my technical skill? Um, I find that when people, you know, there's the old saying, if all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and it's kind of like for technical people, if, if what you're really good at is building websites, everything looks like a website problem. Um, and it's like, oh, we need a new website to fix that. Um, and actually, if you can park that mindset and just really get into almost like a coach or an advisor role, listening to the problem and thinking about all the possible ways that that could be solved, it opens up more scope for a powerful partnership to, to evolve. Yeah, I really like that. I mean, we're so heavily invested in our craft a lot of the time, um, creatives, um, that we, we, we struggle to look, look beyond it often. I think what you're saying there is really you know, inspirational, really, to think, think genuine problem solver and, you know, and take it further than just what we do individually. Um, what... I mean, you've got kind of touched upon it. What sort of takeaways might you have left the room? And it's, it's a very um, actionable conference. We like to people to, you know, see great speakers and get great inspiration, be able to walk away, taking, taking advice and guides into their lives. What might you have left people with, do you think? Yeah, look, I would love to inspire people to think about the idea that probably the biggest liftoff moment um, a business has that makes everything else work is when you can associate with a, with a well-known person, a key person of influence. So, um, you know, a lot of, you know, I know it sounds so, so strange, but like, for, for example, I've just been watching this documentary about Michael Jordan and Nike and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, Nike was quite a small company compared to Puma and Adidas. And then they did this game-changing deal with Michael Jordan. And when he, he, he turned up, they had a big sign for him and his father and they, really had done their research and they presented a full range of options and they Michael Jordan didn't want to sign, sign the deal with Nike. He actually had in mind that he wanted to do a deal with Adidas. And then they came in and they structured the deal and they structured the partnership and they were so much more enthusiastic about putting that deal together that he went with Nike, this little company by comparison in 1983. And, um, and then they had anticipated doing $3 million worth of sales uh, in that in basketball shoes and they ended up doing 128 million dollars worth of sales in year one in basketball shoes so it was a completely game-changing revolutionary deal and it's funny because human human brains are so simple they're so basic and it's kind of like oh well if michael jordan likes those shoes then i'll buy those shoes and it's funny because the same thing is true with creatives it's like oh well if that well-known individual uses that creative agency, then that must be the right person I should go with as well. There's a real cut through that happens when you align to a key person of influence. If you can find a key person of influence who can kind of align to your brand, who can you know, be an ambassador to the brand, be a non-executive director to the brand, be a speaker at a regular conference, or alternatively, if you as the founder of the creative agency can play more of that role out from, out from behind the computer, up on a stage, talking, uh, podcasting, putting stuff out there in the marketplace, writing articles. If you can play that key person of influence role yourself, that tends to be the game changer that leads to all sorts of other partnerships. Um, that unlocks distribution, it unlocks product, it unlocks finance and investment. All of that kind of starts to flow when you've got that uh, person in place. 
Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, visibility is one thing. So getting out there and doing it. What advice could you give to people to make that visibility count to, uh, to really add value to their presence when they're doing these talks? And yeah, so the relationship tends to work because I've had this relationship many times. The relationship tends to work when you've got someone who can create buzz, but then you've got the sales capability behind the scenes to turn buzz into business. Um, and it's really great point. And I'm so glad you asked that question because buzz alone, uh, is a short lived phenomenon. You know, someone can create a bit of buzz at a conference and for on the day, they can actually have lots of people coming up to them and saying, Hey, I'd love to do something. Can we talk? And then if you wait one week, people have completely forgotten that, uh, that they even said that. Um, so it's really important to, if someone's playing that role, that you pin it down into sales meetings, sales appointments, proposals, and, and actually following up and doing the sales work. So it's that, that bridge where the buzz turns into that business um, is, is an extremely important bridge. Um, I'm gonna say this, uh, I, I run a business that is in Australia and um, the USA and the UK as our primary offices. Um, and <clears throat> I would say that the USA, um, especially in the creative industry, they really get that it's a sales business. So they are aggressively selling all the time. They have people going out to networking functions. You know, they turn leads into appointments, appointments into presentations and proposals and proposals into sales. And they grab you by the jugular and they keel haul you across the line. And before you know it, you've signed up to a $7,000 package and then that leads to a $15,000 sale. And then Next thing, you know, you're 25 grand in before you realize, oh my goodness, what happened? I've, I've, I've signed up for something. I mean, they are, they are you know, they're a, they're a 10 out of 10 for sales, um, for, for sales drive. Then you go to Australia. Australia is probably a seven out of 10. They're, they're a little bit softer than the Americans. Um, they, you know, they're just a little bit more friendly, a bit more rapport, slow it down a little bit. Um, a bit more, let's get to know each other, let's be mates. Um, and then you come to the UK and I would say London is a three or a four out of 10 on that scale. And then as soon as you go north, it's down to a two or a one. So I've seen creative agencies that are up in Manchester and outside of London and clients are practically sitting on their lap, licking their face before they will suggest that we should actually do do some business and it's um it's almost painful to watch um so unfortunately the piece of advice i'd say is you're going to have to be a bit more american um or at least a little bit more aussie uh in in the approach of of actually turning buzz into business following up asking for the business when do you want to get started how did you want to make do you want us to send you through a, a um uh you know a, a, pro a proposal do you want us to send you through an invoice would you like to get started um, you know, like actually going for the business and asking for the business and not just leaving it out there for them to follow up, for the customer to follow up. Assume that customers are not proactive. Yes, I think that's a, that's a common comment, isn't it, about Britishness and, well, I've had Northern Britishness. I hadn't heard that one before, but it's, yeah, we get more reticent and <laughs> we'll all forget. So great advice. That's really, that's really brilliant, Daniel. It's such a shame we won't... Um, we won't get to see you on the 19th of June in person, but um, we'll definitely, uh, this, this is a happening thing and uh, we'll get you up to Manchester very soon, hopefully, and uh, meet you in person and get you presenting in person. It'd be great because it's, I mean, a big fan of your, your written work. Do you want to briefly talk about, mention your books and your... Yeah, so there's four books in the series. Um, <clears throat> entrepreneur Revolution is about the trends of why it's a great time to be an entrepreneur and how you might get started. But many of your clients would be people who, uh, or your attendees would be people who've already gotten started. Key person of influence is about standing out as an individual who, who kind of is a thought leader in the space, who's uh, one of the bright, shiny people in the industry who attracts opportunities. Oversubscribed is about running campaigns and promotions and getting um, getting people to line up to do business with you, creating a bit of a waiting list, demand and supply tension. 24 Assets is about building out the full business so you've got the capacity to scale. So there's four books in the series like Harry Potter or something like that of entrepreneurship. Um, and, uh, and you can kind of, they're, they're written in a particular order 
from starting from getting started to standing out to sort of scaling up and uh, and having a business that sort of stands on its own as an asset that's great business magic <laughs> daniel thank you so much for your time really generous of you it's appreciated and like i said earlier we'll see you in manchester very soon at creative north excellent looking forward to it cheers